reading to you from 2 Timothy and the fourth chapter and the first verse. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. Good evening, my dear listening friends. Again, this evangelist Cecil Moe, and as you know, I'm a converted alcoholic. Gave my heart to Christ over 51 years ago in a pastor's home in Seattle, Washington, and then one year later, God changed my life and called me to preach. Well, I've been trying to do it. Oh, I made mistakes, I'll tell you the truth. But if you tell me someone has not made a mistake, and he don't say he never made a mistake, he's not telling you the truth, is he? Well, listen, I'll be with you for a half an hour at night. Won't you kick off your slippers and pour yourself a glass of, maybe a hot tea would be good tonight, or a chocolate. Let's see what the Lord has for us, okay? If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the 16th chapter of Acts. And let's begin reading with the verse, the ninth verse. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A certain man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Well, I've labeled this come to the mission fields. And you know, when we think of missions or missionaries, we first we think about Africa or China. Well, we are to be missionaries where we live also. You know, it was an exciting time for the early church. Remember the day of Pentecost? Now, you'd wonder, who do you suppose the Lord's going to call to be his evangelist on that day. Well, you know who he called. He called old Peter, the one that (laughs) made so many mistakes, and he was arrogant, and he was, oh, he was a character. Tough old fisherman. But, oh, my dear friends, on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached his most powerful message. 3,000 souls were saved in that meeting, And then shortly after that, he preached, and 5,000 people were saved. Peter had a message from on high. Oh, friends, that's what every preacher wants, to have a message from God, because God wants to direct his church. He wants to direct his children. And uh, after that day of Pentecost, believers and churches were multiplied by the hundreds. You know what's amazing to me? Of course, they didn't have television, they didn't have radio, they didn't have airplanes. Uh, What they really, to get the gospel out, they used donkey power or foot power. And can you imagine us preachers going out and walking 30 miles to preach? Don't think so. I would like to think I would. I would like to think I would. Paul changed from a persecutor to a preacher. Oh, my stars. Here was a man that thought he was doing God a favor by wrecking churches and and beating up on Christians, putting them in jail, even to killing them. And he thought he was doing God a great favor. But, you know, later, after after Saul was converted and his name was changed to Paul, he said, you know, folks, I did this in total ignorance. And believe me, it was. Now, he went on a missionary journey to tell the good news, but 
the thing that I first I want is Paul's vision at Troas. And passing by Mycenae, <clears throat> they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A certain man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Nowadays, you know, if you're going to, if you feel a call to be a missionary, they take you before the mission a uh, bunch of preachers to check you out and to see if you're capable and you got to have certain finances. Back in Paul's day, when he got a call, he went. He heard the Macedonia call, come over unto Macedonia to help us. Now here's some of the lessons from Paul's Macedonian call. Verse 9, and a vision appeared to Paul in that night. A certain man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Lost souls call us to the mission field. These people are lost and sin without hope. These people have never heard the gospel. They do not know that God loves us. They do not know that Christ died to save them. They do not know that he arose and offers them <clears throat> eternal life. Now, here's what he said in Romans 10, 14. Well, I found it. <laughs> How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How can they hear without a preacher? Well, they can't. Let me ask you something, friends. Do you hear the call of the lost even tonight? Are you willing to tell them of Christ and his love? You know, friends, I remember Tom Baird, the man that introduced me to Christ, who's in glory tonight. And uh, he was in a Idaho, pastoring a church there. He called me over to preach a weekend revival, and I remember going to his going to his house, and he said, "Cecil, I've got an alcoholic man over here. He's got three little children and a wonderful wife, and I want you to go over and tell them what Jesus did for you." And I said, "Let's go." So we drove over to this place, and it was a trailer house, and it looked like it was a Salvation Army giveaway. And uh, we walked in, and Tom Barry introduced me and told me that told this man that I, too, had been an alcoholic, but I'd been sober about 30 years. So I sat and I talked to this man about Jesus. Pretty soon, friends, he stood up. He held his hand up. He said, I've heard enough. I don't want to hear no more. I, you have put down my church. I said, what do you mean? I have not mentioned any church by name or any denomination. He said, well, what you're saying, my church doesn't preach. See, he wanted itching ears. So I told him, well, this is your house. You want me to leave? I certainly will. And the preacher and I walked out of that house, and I remember Tom throwing his body over the hood of his car and weeping uncontrollable. This man had been praying for a long time for this alcoholic, and he thought maybe the message I would have would help him. Listen, if the Holy Spirit of God doesn't draw your heart, I don't care how long we talk, how long we preach. Jesus has to draw them. This man did not want to be drawn. He just wanted to go his hellbound way, drinking and having his good time. The love of souls should cause us to heed the call. And you know, friends, Paul had a deep love for souls. Listen to what he said in Romans 9, 13. 
I am telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Oh, listen. I don't know of any men that had much more compassion for lost people than Paul. You know, friends, that's why he was so effective. He sold out to Jesus, lock, stock, and barrel. There's too many Christians today who really don't care whether people spend eternity. They don't. Re and it scares me. How could the love of God dwell in their heart if they don't want to see precious souls saved? You know, there's churches, pastors, who will preach and say, Now, if you uh, have been touched by the message today and you would like to talk further about accepting Christ, meet me in my study at so-and-so and so-and-so. How corny! How stupid! When a Spirit of God dwells and gets a hold of a person's heart, now is the time of salvation. Down at the rescue mission, I preach down there, and we see hundreds of people saved over the years. And the thing is, when I give an invitation, I ask the men or the women or the children to come forward and stand before the altar there. And by coming forward, you're telling the world that you have repented of your sin and you've invited Christ in your heart. Then I have a word of encouragement for them and a word of prayer, and I dismiss them. A lot of preachers take them to the prayer room. Never the, the, the rest of people never see them come to Christ. Oh, that scares me. See how quickly Paul and Silas re responded to the call. You know, they went on to Philippi, the chief city of Macedonia, and Paul preached at a prayer meeting by a river, and Lydia was converted. Wasn't that something? Lydia was at the right place at the right time, but God had planned that meeting. Yes, he did. You know, some of you who might not be born again are listening to this broadcast for the first time and you're saying, I wonder why I'm listening to that crazy guy. It's because the Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart and wants to give you something that you have not had. Salvation and peace with God. Remember he delivered a demon possession, de uh, possessed fortune teller? In prison, Paul and Silas preached the jailer, <laughs> or reached the jailer for Christ. Now, I remember, boy, howdy, when that earthquake come, I want you to know it was scary. And even the doors of the prison just flopped off on the ground. Well, the jailer thought that the guys had escaped, and he knew if they'd escaped, he would be put to death. He run in that jail and... Uh, Paul said, and he had a sword in his hand to do his self in. And Paul said, sir, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. And before he could think, the jailer said, good sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now, what did this jailer do? He took a rag and some water. And he washed off the wounds of their backs and their legs and their arms. And he said, gentlemen, would you come to my home? This is midnight. And they go to this jailer's house. And Paul preached unto them Jesus. His whole family was ex accepted Christ. And they even asked to be baptized in the middle of the night. What, to be saved? No. To be baptized because they have been saved. You see, friends, baptism is an act of obedience. I think I told you a long time ago that my wife and I got baptized together. The only difference was she wasn't saved. 
She was a head believer. She really believed that she was going to go to heaven. But, well, guess what happened? Shortly after that, she did accept Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, I told her, I said, Now, Jean, you have to get baptized scripturally. And she said, What do you mean? I've already been baptized. I said, No, you haven't. You went down a sinner and come up a sinner. Well, anyway, God's Holy Spirit finally got a hold of her heart, and so she decided that she should be baptized and she got baptized. Now, here is what she told me, friends. She said, Cecil, I used to bother me that I couldn't understand anything about the scriptures. But now the scriptures are crystal clear to me. Why? Because she, act of obedience, baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, oh, to walk and walk in the newness of life. Friends, I don't put as much confidence in a lot of churches. Really, if you get saved and you invite Christ in your heart, you got to get baptized that day because if the next day you'd get killed, you'd go to hell. What are they saying? They're saying that baptism is a part of your salvation. Beloved, it is not. You're saved by grace through faith. That not yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See that suicidal jailer now is a believer great victories await us when we heed the hall the call to reach the lost look around the mission field surrounds us and it tells us in matthew 13 38 and the field is the world and as for the good seed these are the sons of the kingdom and the tares are the sons of of the evil one. You know, friends, I remember one time when our ship was in Guadalcanal. We were training the Marines, getting ready to take them to the invasion of Okinawa. And dead Japanese would be floating around in the bay, and we'd throw apples at them. One day it hit me like a ton of bricks. I wasn't a Christian, but I got to think it. That man was a soul. That man had a soul. That man was a father, a son, a grandson. And it really, really, really troubled me. Well, I quit throwing apples in pairs at dead bodies. One time, after the war was over, before I ever become a Christian, I hated the Japanese with a passion. Oh, I did, honestly. I have to tell you the truth. I hated all Japanese. After I got converted to Christ, it worried me that I had this hurt in my heart for them. One February banquet, Valentine banquet at our church, there was a man stood up and said, I received a call from Dub Jackson out of Dallas today. He's looking for some preachers to go to Japan to preach revivals. It was just like an arrow through my heart. I knew I had to go to the Japan. I had to go. I held up my hand and I said, I'm willing to volunteer to go to preach. Well, they contacted me the next day and Dub Jackson said, you want to go to Sapporo? That's where they had the Winter Olympics. And so I said, yes. So seven preachers and their wives, we boarded a plane and we flew to Sapporo, Japan. I preached a week revival. I never got such an awakening in my life. One day, a bunch of college students from the University of Sapporo and I went out and handed handbills out to uh, in apartments and houses. I could not speak one word Japanese. They could not speak one word American. We fellowshiped, we laughed, we prayed together. What a time we did have. When the revivals were all over, all the pastors met in this big church in Sapporo with the people. There was hundreds of Japanese people. And we stood up together and we sang now we belong to Jesus. 
You know what? They sang in Japanese and we sang in English. I'll tell you, if there was a Pentecostal, that was a meeting that night. Oh, what a spiritual meeting. And I remember when we got ready to tell them goodbye, they told us that we were not just supposed to hug them. We'd just shake hands and be on our way. Well, when we stuck our hand out, that didn't work. They threw their arms around us and they hugged our necks and they loved us and Oh, they thanked us for coming over to tell them about Jesus. One of the greatest joys I received over there, beside introducing women and men to Christ, the deacons in that church I preached in wanted to know if I would consider coming to support to be their pastor. Oh, I said, thank you so much for that wonderful honor. I am not a pastor. I would be a flop and a failure Friend, did you know that's why there's a lot of failures in church today? Pastors should be pastors. Evangelists should be evangelists. Teachers should be teachers. Deacons should be deacons. They're a special call, every one of us. Now, I'm the first to say that if a real God-called pastor is serving his church, he does ha- own, he has a lot more work to do than I do as an evangelist. They have to do so much more. Evangelist goes in and we tell them how to be saved. We teach them how to win souls. Then we leave. Then the pastor's stuck with the problems. (laughs) Well, see how Paul and Silas seized every opportunity in Macedonia? I wonder how many opportunities we have seized today. How many people have you told of Jesus and his love. Listen, brothers and sisters, I want to ask you the most personal question. Have you ever introduced a soul to Christ? If not, why not? The ball is in your your court. Do you hear the cries of the lost ones around you? They're crying out for your message every day. Friends, I've said this a million times and I'll continue to say it. God is not looking for super spirituals. God is looking for men and women who are available. You don't have to be good looking. You don't have to dress like a model. If you're born again and your name's written in the Lamb Book of Life and you know John 3, 16. You're equipped to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. People right now, today, are waiting for you. They know you're a Christian, but you haven't talked to them about their soul. You know the thing I think that bothers people the most when the, when you bring them, when you ask them if they'd like to put their trust in Jesus, when they say no, you think that they're saying no to you. No, they're saying no to Jesus. But we need to give them an opportunity. Now, if I'm, if I'm out there and I inv- I say to this gentleman, a friend, would you like to put your trust in Jesus today and accept him as Savior? And if he says no, I stop right there. I don't go on any further. He said no. If he says well, and then I'll say well, I'll tell you what, I'll continue to pray for you because I know the struggle you're going through because I too was lost one time and undone without Christ. Friends, let me ask you this. Are you ready to go to the mission field right where you live? You say, Cecil, wait a minute. Now, no, I'm not talking about Africa. I'm not talking about China. I'm not talking about Japan or South America. I'm talking about good old USA where you live right today. That's a mission field. He's put you there and he's waiting for you to do something for him. And you know, friends, if we are available, he will put people in your way. He sure will. I've led people to Christ on airplanes, trains, houses, restaurants. And I'm not anything special. In fact, the matter is I'm not special at all. All in the world I am is a messenger boy for Jesus. Now tonight, would you like to say, Lord, I really want to be a missionary 
right here in my hometown. Let's pray, shall we? Father, for that dear man, that dear woman, that dear young man, young woman, that the Holy Spirit of God has got a hold of their heart tonight. Help them to turn everything over to you. Bring their all to the altar. And there they will find that peace that you want them to go and to be soul winners and witnesses for Jesus. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You say, Cecil, I'm not even born again. I don't know Jesus. Do you want to know him tonight? Do you want to know that your sins have been thrown in the sea of forgetfulness? You say, yes, I would. Well, here's what you got to do. If the Holy Spirit of God is tugging at your heart, he wants you to pray this simple prayer. Oh, dear friends, that's a powerful prayer. I don't want you to pray it unless you mean it. Here's how it goes. Dear Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner. Lord, I'm sorry for all the things I've done to you and against you. Right now, Lord, I'm opening my heart and receiving you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Beloved, if you prayed that prayer, won't you get on the phone? Call 303-471-8534. I want to talk to you. I won't use your name on the air. I won't embarrass you. I won't sit down and write and ask you for any money. And friend, I don't care where you go to church. I'm really concerned where you spend eternity. I'm waiting for your call right now. 303-471-8534. For the past 20 minutes or to half hour, your host has been Evangelist Cecil Moe. Thank you, dear friends, for listening. I want you to continue to pray for our ladies' work and our alpaca ranch. It will be a blessing, and it will be a show place for Jesus. Pray for our health and our prison ministries. We'd appreciate that. So until this time next Sunday night, I want you to be good to your neighbors. Stay sweet. Keep looking up for this wonderful, wonderful Jesus. It's coming soon. Good night and may God bless you real, real good.